before because I was facing that way instead of this way. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but tonight is all sponsored by Ranger, Ranger Boat Company, who is a huge sponsor of FM Online. We thank them for everything they do for us, as I'm sure Mr. Scarlett thanks Ranger for everything they do for him. Uh, so if you have any questions at all, stop back here at the big black, black and red Ranger booth, talk to Troy Morris, talk to Brian Gronwald from Ray's Marine in Moorhead, and let's talk Ranger boats. All right, let's get Tommy going on some crappie action. Thank you, Scott. And thanks again, Ranger Boats. This marks my 21st year with Ranger, and uh, I worked with a lot of reps, and I'm not saying this because he's, I wish he wasn't here, because then uh, people would realize the seriousness. Probably the best rep I've ever worked with is with Troy Morris. He's a straight shooter, and he's gonna put you in the best product available if you want to run a Ranger. So in any event, thanks Troy, and thanks Ranger. Okay, now we're, I'm gonna have a little bit of fun, and uh, the reason being is that after Fishing walleyes competitively since 1989, which again kind of dates me a little bit. I've fallen back in love with both competitive fishing and fishing through crappies. While I do the crappie seminar though, there's a lot of walleye tactics right now. The reason that I think me and my partner have been so competitive is we're going down south and we are applying walleye tactics to crappies. So these crappie tactics aren't just for crappies, if you start thinking open water suspended walleyes up north here, this will also bring up your crappie game as well. The one thing to remember though is surrounding us in the Minnesota lakes, the North Dakota lakes, South Dakota are crappies. Tons of crappies. And you guys have got a ton of crappies out west here in North Dakota that you may not know are there or you just may not have targeted. And you know, crappies are a great fish. You can kill a bunch of crappies or harvest a bunch of crappies, I guess I should say, and nobody's gonna get mad at you. The, 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 the actual topic down south, they call it release to the grease. And um, they're, they're a great form of sustenance. God has blessed us with some high class quality protein when it comes to both walleyes and crappies. But in any event, what the heck am I doing fishing crappies? A walleye guy? You know, and again, I, you know, my, my career, I'm really enjoying walleye fishing. I'm also an ice fishing guy. <laughs> this, this hasn't been happening in the last couple of days, though. So I rolled over here from Iowa. You guys had 10, 10 degrees. I'm thinking, heat wave, because it was 10 below when I looked at the thermometer last night when I let my lap out. But in any event, I, you know, I love ice fishing, and I grew up ice fishing for crappies. I do this seminar down south, and I tell them about how we drive out of the ice. And all the southern boys go, man, there's got to be something wrong with y'all. You guys got to screw loose. I wouldn't drive, I tell them about semis out on the ice, they're like, I wouldn't drive a mini bike out on the ice. There's something wrong. And then I tell them about my buddies' shacks or some of the stuff we've got, the communities we've got, all the comforts at home. I get to go fishing with my friend Ross Grothy. We got, you know, he's got recliners, he's got uh, uh, depth finders, he's got TVs. He, we got every, all the comforts at home when we're ice fishing. But I love to catch crappies through the ice. We used to ice fish in Rathbun, Iowa, on, on, on the reservoir there. And we'd stop fishing when each one of us had a five gallon bucket full of crappies, because that was the limit. However many crappies you wanted to clean. Iowa didn't want to put a limit on crappies or bluegills. And it, it makes a lot of sense. When normally a, an angler would stop at a meal, like seven or eight or nine or 10 crappies, and all of a sudden you got a limit of 25, they're not gonna feel like they succeeded until they reach their limit. Now with walleyes, I've got a philosophy on eating walleyes. And I gotta be very careful because I'm out west to where, you know, it's, it's, it's an ag community, it's a harvesting community. I remember the first time at the Fargo Dome, I talked about selective harvest with walleye and I thought they were gonna string me up. Boy, when you come out to the Dakotas, we eat walleyes out here. But in any event, with crop walleyes, you wanna keep the little ones? And if you get a great big one, you don't have to feel guilty about keeping the great big walleye. And the reason being is, is that that 27, 28, 29, 30 inch fish, putting it back in the water is pretty much gonna keep it there for a trophy for somebody else, but it doesn't have many years to spawn left. The key fish are females, 18 inches or bigger, even 17 inch females. Now, if you can catch a fish in the spring that's melting, that's a great fish to catch because it's a male and males 
in the grand scheme of fishing are cheap. Walleyes are communal spawners, the, egg, the hens drop their eggs, the males come in behind them to fertilize them, and in turn is, they got plenty of fertilization. It's like hanging out probably at a club meeting, there's plenty of fertilization going around at that club meeting. But in any event, with crappies, you, you want to throw away the little ones and you want to throw back the big ones, but you want to keep the mid-range fish. Those 10, 11, 12 inch crappies are better to keep 13, 14, 15, 16, because the bigger fish in a bluegill or crappie atmosphere protect their youth. So the profile, the bigger the profile, the more those spawn fish get up. But again, crappies and bluegills are also a forage fish that grows rapidly, even up north here, and you don't have to worry so much about harvesting those fish, even if you catch the bigger ones. Now, Oklahoma, their limit is 37. Can anybody tell me why Oklahoma has a limit of 37 crappies? How many feet Easy now, I got friends from Oklahoma that are probably gonna be watching this somehow. They had half the state when they went to impose a limit, like Iowa went to impose a limit, half the state wanted 25, the other half the state wanted 50, and some good old boy says, well, we'll just split it right down the middle, make it 37 and a half. And another one says, well, I don't think you can cut a crappie in half and let the other half go. You're gonna have to give it to your buddy and that might get confused, so they went to 37 more. <laughs> but in any event, Florida a week ago, this was me on Saturday. And that was Kyle, my partner. We got <coughs> second in a tournament down in Florida, and we were using these same tactics that I'm about to share with you. These tactics were the ones that we used to employ to win the Crappie Masters National Championship. And at the time, set the crappie world on its ear. We won by well over a pound. We went and beat over 200 of the world's best crappie anglers at the Grenada, uh, the Lake Grenada, which is down in Mississippi, in the Crappie Masters National Championship. But what we did was we employed really strange tactics by using crankbaits and planer boards and in a bite that they said that crankbaits weren't working. So before I get into how we caught two to three pound crappies, what I'm going to talk about is where I kind of came up with the idea. Through the years I've caught tons of crappies pre-fishing for walleyes in these tournaments. Lake Winnebago, um, over uh, any, any system like the Great Lakes, sometimes we'll run into them. Just here this last year on Lake Oahe, we ran into a bunch of crappies. And usually when I'm out walleye, fishing for a walleye tournament, we catch four or five or six crappies. We do the same thing that a bass angler does when he's pre-fishing for a bass tournament when he catches walleyes. They get eight. They're at it. And um, I moved to Walker, Minnesota, and I'm living there with my wife. And uh, we, we hadn't had any children yet. And she's going to have her cousin Callie come up. Now, Callie was dating another cat at the time. This is her husband here right now. She was, she was dating a guy out of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 45 minutes from my hometown, by the name of Kyle. And Kyle was one of my, and still is, one of my only walleye fans. He thought, man, he's Tommy's from Iowa, he's won some tournaments, he's famous, and I want to go fishing with him. But he was dating, this was all by chance, he was dating Callie before this all came along. So anyway, Callie wants to come up, she tells Michelle, Michelle says, Callie, and she's going to bring Kyle with her. I said, oh, great. How old are they? 16. All right, well, Kyle's sleeping in the basement, Callie's sleeping upstairs. We got that established. Now I'm starting to sound like my dad, right? Kyle wants to go fishing with me, honey. I'm like, what? You need to take, you're going to take us all fishing. Now my wife's telling me this, and Michelle, God bless her, doesn't tell me too many things. But when she does, I listen, because it means the boss has spoken, and we're going fishing. And I'm like, baby, how could you do this to me? I don't do what to you? I said, I got a bite. It's Leech Lake, it's like in the, in, the, in, the, in the era of 2002, 2003, when every walleye was gone from Leech Lake. And I don't know, I'm, I'm traveling all over the country. I got bites in Wisconsin, I got bites in North Dakota, Montana. I got bites in New York, but I ain't got one here. Well, you're just gonna have to figure it out. Honey, you're a professional fisherman. You're always catching them, ain't you? I'm just like you guys and girls in this audience. There are times when I think that I will never catch another walleye as long as I live. So I'm starting to think about, oh, who can I call? Well, if I call the guy, it's ain't going to put me on any fish. We're not going to tell that pro where we're catching our fish. I thought about Red Lake. Red Lake had gone through a paradigm to where all the walleyes had been netted and caught. They blame a lot on the netting, but there was hook and line traffic on, on Red Lake that took a lot of those fish out of the tube. And there was probably about, I'd say, 
10,000 anglers hit the ice every winter catching all these big crappies, and I was one of them. We'd go there in the winter and we'd catch, uh, you know, our limit of crappies, and, and they were huge, and everybody was pulling all these crappies out because they're starting this walleye restocking program on Red Lake, and they want to bring back the walleyes, and it befuddled me. Why don't they just keep it this premier crappie destination? But the problem is there weren't a little crappies growing up because all the big crappies was eating them, right? So I'm thinking, well, we can go there and we'll troll plant crankbaits on planter boards because I've caught them on Winnebago going two to three miles per hour and whaled on them. And if I can catch black crappies on Lake Winnebago, I can catch them on Red Lake. So we got four of us. It's Minnesota. It's a one-rod state. We put four planter boards out. I've got a spread now. It's not like two people holding on to one pole. It's you got a spread. I got the combine going. We roll up to the lake, and the fish ain't biting. The crappie fish ain't happening. The lady at the ramp says, you might as well just go home. You're wasting your time. All the crappies swim to the other side of the lake at this time of the year. Everybody can catch crappies when it's spring, and those fish have gone up to the dock, underneath the dock, and the pencil reeds up shallow. They're easy to find because if you take this whole big entire lake, and they're just going to relate to the edges of it, we just cut that down to about 1% of the surface acres of those lakes is where those fish are swimming. But in the summertime, they disperse. And they swim out in the middle and they relate to forage fish. They go places where most anglers have never thought of chasing a crop. And at Red Lake, you've got about a third of it you can fish, and the other two thirds is reservation. So I figured I'm going to go out there and we ain't got a whole lot of water to fish. We'll just troll around like this two, three miles per hour. I can cover the whole thing in about three hours. So the lady says, I'm going to let you launch for free. I'm not even going to charge you a launch. We get out and I have Kyle pick out some lures. And Callie picks out a lure, and my wife picks out a lure, and the girls always pick out the pretty lures. Pay attention to what a woman picks out a lure. We called home one day, a good buddy of mine, John Kalinske, and he called Karen. He said, Karen, what, what color should I be using, honey? He used to joke with her and pick on her. She says, well, it's really hot. Use blue, because blue's a cool color, and I think the walleyes are going to like it. And by golly, they wanted blue the rest of the trip. So in any event, <laughs> the girls picked out pretty color. They picked out blue that day, blue chrome. And we're burning all over two to three miles per hour. And we got one small perch and one small crappie, I think. No walleyes, no northerns. You can't keep the walleyes at the time. And I'm thinking, man, it's, I knew this would happen. I knew that, and I, I, I even think I heard Kyle go, I thought he was a professional. I thought he was a professional. <laughs> so I'm about ready to quit. And I'm like, you know what, guys? What do you guys think? You, you guys want to go get something to eat? Or you guys can we'll go back and me and Kyle go fishing around. You girls can go shopping couple hundred, three hundred dollars, you know, and try to buy my way out of it now. Then Cali spills her pop and I was like, that's it, we're going, you know, on the, on the brand new carpet of my Ranger, and I'm like, we're out of here. So I kill the kicker motor, we start picking everything up, we're cleaning up the coke. The last thing I ever do is reel in the lures, because just like that deer running across the field, if there's lead in there, I got a chance. And if there's lure in the water, the last thing you do is you pull up the lures when you're getting ready to move to another spot. And I look over, and I killed the kicker motor, and there's a board going like this. And I said, Callie, reel that line in. It was her line. She reeled it in, 15-inch crappie. I look over here, Michelle, reel your line in, 15-and-a-half-inch crappie. What did I change? Speed. Went from 2 to 3 miles per hour to 0.8. Wind had just come up a little bit. I had gone out there, and when I was burning around, I marked fish, like right in this area right here. So if this is the area we could fish, there was fish, like right where Callie's pretty little face is right here. So I went back upwind, it was down here where we caught the fish, I stored a coordinate, where we caught the other fish, I stored a coordinate, came back up, and I'm going to slow troll through that school of fish. I'm going to slice them and dice them. And we ended up getting 16, 17 crappies that were some of the biggest crappies you've ever seen, and I have redeemed myself on once again. Kyle's superstar. And I filed that away in the memory bank. Cold front, high skies, fish ain't biting, go slow. Drag those baits along to where those fish have to come up and eat them. They never left the middle of the lake. They just had all the food that they wanted or whatever, and they weren't biting in the doldrums of summer, what other people were accustomed, or most people were fishing shallow. So I always try to remember, the biggest mistake I think I've made in fishing is I haven't kept a diary of everything. And I haven't remembered a lot of stuff. I think my biggest asset is I haven't remembered a lot of stuff. So I keep an open mind. To qualify for the Crappie Masters Championship, we had to go through a qualifier, and there was one in Iowa. 
Rathbun Lake, which is the one I used to ice fish, used to fill buckets with them. My problem is, is a lot of those fish now are about this big. And they're growing up, but you know, they, they, they were extremely tough fish. Now I fished it for open water for walleyes. I caught a lot of crappies ice fishing. While I was open water fishing for walleyes, I caught a lot of crappies by accident. The problem is, is that Rathbun was flooded and all the fish had gone up into the trees or the brush. So you could take your brush piles, you could take anything you had going normally, throw it out the window. They were also pre-spawn cold front, and those bigger fish would be suspended out from wherever you'd find males. So if you found a bunch of males up shallow, which are usually with black crappies or white crappies, the darker of the two, people oftentimes will call a male white crappie a black crappie, where a black crappie has a bunch of speckles on it, a white crappie has bars on it. And until you get to southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, or South Dakota, you don't see probably a lot of white crappies up in this neck of the woods. So we're out there trying to figure out these fish. And I got a friend, I'm going through all the details. When I go to pre-fishing tournament, I look up every, all the standings for the last five to 10 years. I call everybody I can. When I go to the bait stores, the first question I don't ask is, where are the fish biting at? I ask them, where's your crankbaits at? Because I'm gonna go get my crankbait fix on. And I get about 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 crankbaits, probably about a hondo, $200. And when I dump all those crankbaits up and I go to get my wallet, then I go, where are the fish biting at? Because the guy that owns the bait store is going to be a lot happier to tell you where the fish are biting at when you got $100 worth of lures on his counters than when you got up and you got your hands in your pockets and you don't plan on taking them out. You know what they call a striped whistler in Iowa? Somebody comes up to Minnesota or North Dakota and he brings a $20 bill and a pair of striped overalls and he doesn't change either of them. And when they say, how much is that crankbait? And he says, $6, he goes, that's a striped whistle. So anyway, uh, my fellow Iwegians on tape, uh, out in the audience, please forgive me. So anyway, Corey and Cody Batterson had won a couple of tournaments. Now, this is, this is Cody when he's like nine or ten. He's putting the boat on the trailer before he can see over the windshield of the Ranger. This is Dad Corey, who's about five foot something. Not much, but you know, where he lacks a little bit in height, the guy makes it up in heart. And he's a tremendous angler. And I call him up and I go, dude, I'm coming down to fish your pond. I'm not asking for any of your spots. But what I want to know is, if we're struggling, will you help us? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll, if you're struggling, I'll help you. I'm not going to put you on the fish. I'll tell you what's going on. But, and I never needed it. We never really needed or used the information that Corey had given us. But he says, you know, if we, if we make it to the championship, Let's work together. Let's share information. You know, kind of like when the guys from here make it to the NTC, a couple, three teams work together. You bring it back to the club, you know, that kind of thing. I'm like, cool, Corey. And uh, Corey had fished it out there and uh, had done well at Grenada. One day, he said, you know, we pull crankbaits out there two, three miles per hour, but we're going to have to figure out something if a cold front hits. I said, did you ever pull them crankbaits under two miles per hour? And he goes, nope. I said, well, we might want to try that when we go out there. I don't want to foreshadow too much, but let's get into how we caught our fish at, at Rathbun. Spider rigging, tight lining. They got all kinds of terms, and that's one of the reasons I'm falling in love with this, is because it's all these cool new terminology that I've never heard before. I mean, they've never heard of one eyes or ice fishing or stuff like that, but spider rigging. Here's what it looks like you got two dudes sitting in the front of the boat. In Minnesota, there'd be a rod here and a rod there. It'd be like two legged rigging. But with spider rigging, you got eight, le eight legs out there, eight rods. And you better like the guy you're fishing with because you sit right next to him just like that. And uh, in turn, I had the, the privilege years ago in a, during a television shoot to fish with both Barry Moreau and Todd Huckabee, two guys from Oklahoma. This cat right here, Todd Huckabee, this hippie, one of the nicest men I've ever met before in my life. And dude, he's cleaned over a million crappies. So I get to go spider rigging with him. And they teach me how to spider rig, and I realize that it's no different than trolling out on the Great Lakes or trolling, say, like Oahe or Sakaka, we have for suspended fish. You just got to find out. First, you got to find out where the fish are at on a horizontal plane, and it's a small world until you got to find a fish in it. Then you got to find out where they're at up and down. And um, we went through that, and I, I basically had a crash course. Now, in Rathbun, another thing that we used was we would use cameras. We'd go up to brush pot brush and drop the camera down and after looking at literally miles of shoreline brush and only seeing little fish, we deduced that all the fish were out deep or staging to move up the spawn. And once you kind of find out and mark them out deeper, those bigger blotches, 
you kind of know where you have to set your lures. Now, in order to spider rig in my Ranger, I only have like one rod holder up here, and in Iowa we can have two more rods. We can have our second rod, which is state law, you can have two rods. And then Iowa's got a deal, for 12 bucks you can buy a third pole. You can buy a third line of fishing license. <laughs> I swear to God, true story. I'm asking these southerners, these, these guys from down south, you gonna buy that? Man, that's a lot of money, that $12. I think we'll just fish with four poles and save the 24 bucks and get us a couple more cases of Milwaukee's best. But in any event, I put rod holders eight inches apart so that I would be able to spider rig in my range. Jarvis Kenny still owns the boat. It's over in Bismarck, North Dakota, or North and Wilton. And he's got he's getting tired of people coming up going, what do you got all them rod holders so close to each other in the front of the boat for? But we was spider rig. Then when you spider rig, you've got leaders that you can hand tie yourself. And this is the old school to where you had a three-way here to back to a grub or an artificial bait or a minnow. And then you got a three-way here back to a grub or bait or an artificial or a minnow. And then you got a sinker. You got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine knots. They got a new thing now called the Caps and Coleman rig to where you can tie on a three-way up here. And then you take an egg sinker and you go through that half ounce to one ounce egg sinker about four times, that was a lot more than four, but I was getting excited about that. And then in turn as you run this down to an Aberdeen hook down below, so you got one, two, three, four, five knots instead of nine knots. And these guys will tie 40, 50, 60 of these a night in a motel room, somewhat similar to when we go to tie spinners for tournaments, or you fished out in Oahe in the trees, you know darn well you better have 20, 30 spinners of the hot spinner the next day in order to fish. They've got these seats back before I showed you that picture where them two cats are sitting side by side. Well, there, that's called, Wally Marshall came up with some stuff called Double Down, where it's two seats. The single seat's a sing and swing and single, but the double down's a double down. And it turned as I had taken my double down from Tempers Fish on down there, and I had the brackets and everything, but I didn't have none of the bolts, and they wouldn't line up with my ranger seats right. So I didn't prepare fully before I left. I was doing everything on the fly. So instead of Double Down Wally, we had to Double Down Walleye. We got a folding chair out of the trailer, staying in a trailer. Of course, in Iowa, you know, staying in a trailer is common in stands. And then this chair right here, this beautiful Paisley vinyl, I'm going back and buying that because that's what we qualify for the championship. I took this one because my back was bothering me, this cushion. I'm going to tell you what, right now, I got an affinity. I'm thinking these might match my carpet. <laughs> but you got two seats side by side, it doesn't matter. And the biggest thing is you don't want them to blow off when you're running. And so you set them down. But long story short, we ended up catching the fish that we needed to go catch these in Grenada. We ended up catching those fish spider rigging. Now, when you're spider rigging, you go set out those eight lines or those six lines. Let's say you mark the fish in six to 14 foot of water. The key to crappies, just like walleyes, is to start your baits at their eye level where you're marking them and above. They got eyes on the top of their head, they feed up. So if you're marking fish from six to 12 foot down and you got an 11 foot rod, you take the hook and you go all the way to the butt of the rod, that's 11 foot deep. You figure out how much line there is from the rod tip down to the surface of the water and you set out that much more line and now you got that one down at 11 foot. The one on the other side of the boat, you set it 10 foot deep. The next one is 9 foot, then 8 foot, then 7 foot, then 6 foot. Two foot above every one of those lures, you got another bait. So those fish are marked at 6 foot, you got a 4 foot rod on. And whichever ones start to fire, you try to bring the lower ones up to that level. If they're really all firing at that level, you bring the higher ones up. But never forsake high fish. Whenever you're trolling for whatever species you're trolling for, don't ever forget those high fish because as the day warms up and the critters start to generate and move up, those fish will move up to eat those critters. So when the algae and the zooplankton and about 62 other names that I cannot pronounce <laughs> start moving through the system, fish will move higher. And that's why you want to always keep your high baits up there. And you know what? If the fish quit biting, most guys go back down to the bottom. Most people lost them. They're up higher so high you can't even hardly mark them. That's, I'm pretty excited. I'm running Ray, Ray Marine products this year. And uh, I can mark fish on side, side vision at 20 to 25 miles per hour with the technology that that's got. That's really going to help with those higher fish. Again, we had to go down to Mississippi, so we cleaned, we drained, and we dried before we went down there and we took crankbaits. When you're gonna troll crankbaits, I got one rule of thumb with crankbaits. Just at least make sure it's tuned. 
I don't know how many times I'll get a big name pro in my boat. We'll go to shoot a television show, we'll go to pre fish, we'll go to hang out. We'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll be fishing, and that big name pro will take that crankbait, lollygag it through the water, and go, yep, it's tuned, and chuck it out. I'll say, no, 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 it's my boat. I'll, I grab the rod, I burn it through the water, and it'll kick out to one side or the other. It's not properly tuned. I've been kicked out of numerous motels for tuning lures in the swimming pool at night past the pool hours. I didn't know it had a liner that you could hook and it would drain the whole pool. But what I'll do is I'll pitch out that lure six foot, burn it back to the rod tip, and if it kicks out one way or the other, it's not tuned. Most people will try to tune a bait improperly. They'll try to bend that eye. They'll use a, a, a lure tuner. I think you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish with one of these. So a turn is, they'll take the needle nose and put both needle nose right on that eye that comes out of the bill to tune it. Because to properly tune it, whichever way it's kicking out, you want to tweak that eye the other way. When you put that needle nose on there and you bend it, it's going to be just like steering on ice. You're going to oversteer and you're going to fishtail. So you try, try to tune it back this way, it's going to kick out that way. You try to tune it back this way, it's going to fishtail that way. The right way to tune a bait, unless you're dealing with, you could put both needle nose on an original Rapala, something where the eye comes out of the nose of the bill, or the bait, but when it comes out of the bill, I will take one needle nose pliers, needle nose, and put it against the bill. The other one I'll put against the wire eye, and I will gently tweak that bait, that eye, the way I want it to swim. If I shook your hand that loose, you pull your hand away and think, man, he's got one sissified handshake. <laughs> if it's swimming out that way, you want to tweak it this way. If it's kicking out this way, you want to put that needle nose there and there, and you want to just gently tweak it that way. And then you'll get it closer and closer, and then, ah, it usually kicks back out the other way. Now you, now you found the breakover point, and you adjust it. You bump bottom, you catch a fish. Every chance you get to take a look at that bait, make sure it's tuned. And what's funny is you change crankbait snips, or snaps, you change line. Oftentimes a bait that was tuned won't be tuned anymore. When we got down there, we'd never seen that body of water before. If there's one thing that has changed my walleye, crappie, any type of fishing at all, it's contour lines. We went out mule deer and elk or mule deer hunting this last fall out to uh, the Missouri River Breaks on Fort Peck. Invaluable was a contour map. Now I'm talking about critters up on the ground. And we figured out that there were certain elevations where those, those animals were hanging because of wind currents, temperatures, etc., etc. Same thing true with fish. When I'm trying to figure out where the bite's at, and let's say you two just tore them up, man, and I see you at the boat ramp or the cleaning station, hey, fellas, how you doing? You think I'm going to walk up to these two crit critters right here and say, where'd you catch them at? What are they going to tell me? In the mouth, in the lake. <laughs> we caught them out there, and they're going to point the wrong toward land. Say, I see you, though, you're at the cleaning station. I'm going to come up, hey, man, how you doing? Man, that's a nice mess of fish there. How deep were you fishing? I don't want to know where you're fishing. How deep were you fishing? Where the fish were. <laughs> OK, man. OK. But I mean, how deep were you? Were you 12 foot? About that? Cool. I just found out the program or part of the program. I found out the depth. In the mix, especially in rivers, but anywhere you go fishing, if you can establish what depth those fish were in, oftentimes you can establish almost all of the program. So when I'm fishing, my mapping or my cartography is huge to what I'm doing. Because if I figure out what depth those fish are at or a depth range, like he said 12, 13 foot right around, I'll go 10 to 15 foot. And I'll figure that this area right here is going to be where those fish are. If I'm trolling and I got a coordinate here, here, and here, I realize that either long or subtle, those fish are all on points. If I'm trolling along and I catch a fish here, and here, and here, and here, and here, all those fish are on cups. So now I'm putting together more of the program. Drop down the camera, find out there's some sand grass down in every spot. Drop down the camera and find out maybe it's just sand. Look at my graph and realize it's a hard bottom where it's hard and a soft transition meet. And that's another piece of the puzzle. But the depth and the contour to me is vital to what I'm going to fish. That's what's cool right now about what Navionics has going on right now and what's called sonar charts. 
most people will wait and hear, well, they're going to do Lake Sakakawea next year, so I'm going to wait until next year, the following year, to buy the chip. Or they're going to do it this summer, so why should I buy it now when I could wait till the fall and I can get all the proper data? We're all driving around as a community right now, a bunch of us, and wherever we drive when we fish or mark, we're recording contours, downloading it to the computer, what looked like this, a week later when you upload the freshest data onto your chart, looks like this. And if you buy a sonar chart from Navionics and a, a card, a Navionics chip, for one year up to registration, you can get freshest data. So if you buy it now, don't register it. Don't tell them I said this. I hope that anybody from Navionics, you didn't hear me say this on the camera. Wait about six, eight weeks. You got about two months and then register it. And then you got a year after that date. So you can have about 14 months from data purchase to qualify for that freshest data, and it makes a big difference. If you've got an old chip, you can buy a $99 update with the same opportunity. What I'm doing now is using Navionics Plus. I, what I fish, I fish saltwater down in Florida when I visit my mom and pops one time a year when they're down there. I fish south, I fish west, I fish east, I fish north, and I fish Canada. If I was to buy six chips at a buck fifty a copy, it'd be close to a thousand. Where with Navionics Plus, wherever I'm going, and if you guys live here in North Dakota and Minnesota and you go over to Montana, you're going to need a west chip and a north chip. And the Dakotas are redundant on the north and the west chip. But with Navionics Plus, I can just download the bodies of water that I want to use. And I'll even break them up into sections so I don't use this. You don't want to download the whole state of Minnesota because you'll burn up your whole two gig chip. Just download the bodies of water you're going to fish. And a lot of times, I'll do it last minute, I'll download Florida. We downloaded Florida three days before we went down there. And we had all, that's Navionics Plus, and it's only about $150 to $200, depending on which one you get. The biggest key with, with contours is you can shade out to the hot depth. So if those fish are in 10 to 15 foot of water, and these are five foot contours, if you've got a five foot contour, you can shade out to 10 foot, and then you just go back and forth in that shaded area, and you're gonna be able to catch fish wherever you're trolling out, where you're looking at. Now when we're staggering baits for crappies, it's no different trolling them, or walleyes, it's no different than trolling them is for spider rigging, is that you wanna put the baits at their eye level or above. And with walleye fishing, a lot of times we'll put the deeper baits closer to the boat because those fish are less spooky, and then your higher up baits go farther away from the boat because as the boat goes through the fish, the fish spook around the boat, and those higher baits are gonna actually trigger those fish. When we were down in Grenada, we had the biggest problem we had is most people had never seen these before and didn't know what they were. So they'd come along and they'd think those were noodles. They'd take those swim noodles from Walmart and they tie lines to them for trot lining or noodling for catfish. And those things are sitting out there. Sometimes they'll drop 30, 40 of them. So you make a trolling pass, you turn around, you come back, you're like, whoa, what happened to my trolling area? And you got some good old boy in a canoe going, hey, don't you hook my lines now. I've got my cat lines out there, but they don't even see these. And if we had trouble, we'd have to reel them in real quick if we had a flat bottom coming, because they'd run right over. But our boards, the farthest ones from the boat were the ones getting bit. And at times, we had to have them three to 400 feet from the boat to get bit. It didn't seem like if they were any closer than that. So boards made all the difference in the world. You take a kid fishing, if I take my wife fishing, trolling is boring to some people. Planar boards will change the way that you troll and the way that you, it's like a big bobber in the water. And what's cool about that, how many people in the audience own planar boards? Raise your hands. Awesome. You do that down south and you maybe have one or two hands go up. Clip it to the line. The line that goes back to the lure clips to the back of the board. The line going to the rod tip goes to the front of the board. You drop in the water. The more line you let out, the farther from the boat it gets. And again, it turns that two-row picker into a combine. And uh, there's some of these tournaments we control four li or eight lines, four lines per person. You got eight boards out in the water, that gets to be a chore. If you don't want to spend all that money on the big boards, you can buy the little boards are $14 and they're reversible. I like the big boards because they float. They're easier to move around. And this one that I showed you, offshore, all these products that I use are from offshore. American made, look for the one with the sun by far the best board on the market to fish with, period. We're out there and we're explaining, after we'd won the championship, how deep our lures were running or where we were targeting these fish. 
an efficient grenade over 8 to 12 foot down. You put a bait from 8 to 12 foot and that's where you caught those fish. Anywhere higher than 8 didn't seem to make, make, make it happen. Any deeper than 12 foot didn't make it happen. We had old boys coming up to saying us, how do you know how deep them lures is getting? Did you get in the water and dive and check out how deep it was with a tape measure? Swear, true story. I'm like, no, we use dive curves. See, I told you they was diving down in the water. I said, no, no, they got these things from precision trolling that are dive curves. You know, you want to get that bait down 12 foot? You put a 57 foot of line, 55 foot of line, dude, you're there. What do you all fish down here? We only fish with three crankbaits down here in Mississippi. We use bandits, bandits, and bandits. <laughs> bandits a heck of a bait. And if you look, they use bombers too, but most of the baits they use for trolling crappies are bandits. If you look at a bandit, and I asked them, how, they go, how, 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 how do you know how much line you let out? I said, well, we got a bunch of different methods, but we use pretty much line counters. Really? I said, how do you know how much line you let out when you're trolling crankbait? Well, we either throw out a cast or a cast and a half or two casts. I'm like, how do you know it's two casts? Well, you cast it behind the boat, you let out enough line to think it's two casts, and that's two casts. Well, let's say a cast is 60 feet of line, and let's say two casts is 120 foot of line, and these fish are 8 to 12 foot down. If I let out, what did I say the first one, 60 foot of line? If I let out 60 foot of line, I'm right at 12 foot or below that. I'm already below the fish. I'm way below them on the other one because bandits have such a, a steep dive curve. Now, if they had been using flicker shads like we were using, and the sevens didn't seem to work, the number sixes worked, they're a suspending bait, number fives worked good too, but the sevens and sixes are the same. Let's say they let out 60 foot of line. That bait was at nine foot, eight, nine foot. They'd be perfect if they had some Yankee crate baits. They'd come up and get and lean on the boat. You know, when you're at a tournament and your fellow competitors, now, None of the guys in Fargo Moorhead Walleyes Unlimited do this, but outside of this area, they come up to talk to you and they say, hey, Tommy, how you doing? That's the last time they'll look at you. Uh-huh. Yeah, you, you caught a couple. Uh-huh. <laughs> they're reading your mail. They're looking. I, when, I, when I'm out, don't ever come and look at my boat thinking you're going to read my mail because I'm a pig. I got lures from three seasons ago <laughs> if I'd had the same boat. <laughs> but I got lures from three tournaments ago. We went down to Florida to fish this tournament this spring. I had river, walleye and crappie lures from last fall still all over the carpet. Connor goes, do you ever clean this boat? And I said, yeah, only when the big shots like Terry Morris from Ranger are looking in it. <laughs> or I know they're going to be at the tournament. But in any event, I had all these flicker shads and, and, and also the little Selma Hornets laying around. They go, man, what are them? And you fish them bandits or a big bait? You fish with them little itty bitty baits. I said, don't pay no attention to them. They don't work. Well, I know they don't work because crankbaits ain't working right now. You're wasting your time. We got told 52 times that crankbaits weren't working. They sure wanted to come up and ask us how they were doing. How you doing, man? You catching any fish? And I'm like, hey, I just prefer not to talk fishing. Oh, yeah, you a little stuck up. You got a little prop there. That, that these good old boys were, were, were out of control. I mean, they, they, little, they wouldn't tell you nothing, but they wanted everything, and they were not shameless enough. They would intimidate you. I just told Kyle, we just got to get our rods and reels run to the room, and then when it's dark, we'll come back out and work underneath the cover because <laughs> they'd work us over for data. Well, by setting lines out with dive curves or figuring out where those baits are at, you can stagger your baits. And we had caught them on hornets in practice. The water got dirty. We need to go to a rattling bait, so we switched to, to flicker shads. And Corey's son, Cody, is 16 years old, and he's over there against the wall during our team meeting. He's doing this. And I'm sitting there like this, because I have been known to football spike electronics when they are used improperly at the dinner table and other situations. My sons fear me when I say I'm going to football spike a Nintendo 3DS, because I've done it. We've got to have obedience, you know, these electronics. Somebody gets an electron phone out at the dinner table and gets a little, you know, I use mine for a clock, but Cody's over there doing this, and Corey sees it and he says, Cody, put the phone away. We've got a team meeting going on. He goes, no, Dad, I'm trying to figure out with my phone app. they got a new phone app by Precision Trolling that actually if you want to put that bait down, you've got a number seven flicker shad, you want to put it down to eight foot, you move the wheel to eight foot, it tells you use 45 foot of line when you use a 10 pound XT. Use a 10 4 fire line which has four pound diameter, move that up here. This number gets shorter because with a thinner diameter, you don't have to let out as much line. If you're ever trolling a number five flicker shad with 10 pound monofilament and you can get it down to eight, nine, 10 feet, 
and you want to get that bait down to 12, 13 foot, go to 10, 4, or 8, 3 fire line. We even use 6, 2 fire line, and that thinner diameter will give you 2, 3, 4 more foot of line. About 150 to 250 foot is about the max I want to let a crankbait out, and it gets non-productive. Some hornets were working good, but when the water got dirty, they wanted something a little bit rattler, and that's when we switched to the flicker sheds. Berkeley, 10 pound line, they used, why use a 10 pound line for these crappies? I said, well, that's because that's what I got on my reels, and that's what all these dive curves are established on. And now we're using that flame green stuff right to the crankbait. I had buddies that used to use it out on Lake Erie and Saginaw Bay and you name it, trolling. I think sometimes fish see the line and notice it and see something swimming at the end of it and go eat it. They have the brain the size of a pea. We've already got them outsmarted. Superstition will make you start thinking, Bill's using fluorocarbon and that's why he's out fishing. Sheila's using that pink jig, and that's why she's out fishing. It's usually that they're doing what they need to do by wiggling that lure right. It ain't nothing else to do a lot of times with all that other junk that's superstition. So don't let that get in your head. We took the big water handles off on our reels and put on little ones because we were fishing for little fish. Duplication was the key. We used line counters. If you guys don't have any line counters, this has been great explaining this to the southern folks, you can use a lot of different methods. You can clip on a line counter. You could count the passes. <laughs> so as that reel, that pass moves on an Abba Garcia 6500 from one side to the other, it's eight foot when you've got a full spool. So if you're gonna put out 80 foot of line, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If it's 77, you just go to nine and three quarters. <laughs> But that's counting the passes, and that makes a big difference. You can use Sharpie markers, which work great. My problem is, is that at 45 years old, God gave me a pair of reading glasses, and I still can't see anything with them. You can take a Sharpie marker, and every 10 foot, put a black mark, and at 50 foot, put a red mark. You're going to put your bait out to 100, count two red marks, and you're there. 90 is red, and four blacks, et cetera, et cetera. Cover up the lens for a second. Or you can use duct tape. We started fishing these. Uh, Bruce DeShano told the pro staff, if I catch you fishing with any other chunk of lead besides a uh, guppy when you're using inlines, the tadpole is designed as an inline diving bait. When you drop it in the water and that crankbait clip comes up to here, it dives. When a fish hits it, the clip slides forward. It goes flat. You don't have to fight the weight like a dipsy diver. So you can actually salmon fish, walleye fish, crappie fish, we just went down to Florida and they said, well, y'all got away with one down in Nader. But when you go to Florida, you ain't going to be able to pull that crap down there. We pulled jigs in Florida. We put, I saw how much line you let, 100 to 200 foot of line. I'm thinking, man, that seems two 30 seconds ounce jigs letting out 150 foot of line is all day long. How am I going to clip seven, eight boards to that junk? We took tadpoles down there in this last tournament in Florida. Figured out the fish finally on the second day. We were all by ourselves. We handled over 60 crappies. The biggest bag in the tournament was 8.65 pounds until we weighed 963. We beat them all in two days by that, by that weight as far as the biggest bag. We vaulted all the way up to second. We almost won the day. We lost it by about a half a pound. We're using these dudes. They go, man, you, now you've done it to us again. First you come down here with them little planter boards, pulling them ducks around, and now you've got to have them tad polys in the water. It's a matter of putting, we put six foot of line out and clap the board to it. I had to reel in all the fish because Kyle's a little over five foot. He couldn't hold the rod tip up enough. But we were reeling in the fish with the planer board down to the tadpole, down to the jigs. I'd hold them as high as he could and he would net them. We put the whole apparatus back in the water and reset the tadpole and boom, we were off fishing again. And we're using the smallest minnows possible. And that was just because of confidence on these little jigs. I, I bet you money that, that power bait or gold would have made all the difference. And what I found out with crappies and bluegills, crappies like power bait, bluegills like gold, if they have a preference. Smallmouth like gold and largemouth like power bait, if they have a preference. It's all based on the seasonings. So that was a week ago, and we launched all the way up into second. We actually had quite a few fish that were a pound and a half, pound and, pound and a quarter. The other thing we did in both tournaments is we used electrics. Crankbaits ain't working. They have no depth control. They're putting them straight behind the boat, and they're using a big motor to blow, 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 at two to three miles per hour. We're using electrics, and we have trolled all over down in Grenada for three days. 
We're catching five, six fish a day. I told Kyle, I said, man, we gotta get that, that up to about 10, 12 if we're gonna cash a check or be competitive. We'd run into some veterans of the sport and they said, how y'all doing? And I made the biggest mistake by saying I caught five fish. I didn't think it was very good. So after about the second or third day, I said, well, we got five yesterday and six today. Man, that's pretty dang good. You, you tell me the truth? I'm like, yeah, I'm telling you the truth. I, I wish it was more than that too. He goes, no, I ain't caught five fish in seven days. So we kind of knew where the fish were at. We slowed down on the second to last day of practice to 0.8 to one miles per hour. We went from here to the wall. We caught a 15 and a half inch, almost a two and a quarter pound crappie. By the time we had gone from here to the street out there, we had five crappies. I looked at Kyle and I said, we just make one more little dial adjustment, find another area where these fish are at, we're gonna win this tournament. In fact, we're working with Corey and Cody. We're gonna get first and second. We told Corey what we were doing. We went out the next day, we caught 20 fish in three and a half hours. Corey hadn't caught anything. I said, Corey, I said, it's based on consistency and the fact that his boards kept getting pulled back and the fish would let go. We were using monofilament, he was using super line. So he was deeper with the numbers we were trolling because of the thinner diameter and the fish would grab it and feel that board and let go of that crankbait again. When that happens, I go to the little boards. The other thing is he had about three different manufacturers reels and he had three different diameters of line. If you've got a half a spool of line on a line counter and you've got a full spool on another one and you let them both out 100 feet, one's gonna be about 100 foot back, the other one's gonna be about 75 foot back. It's all based on diameters and what do they call that, like engineering and stuff like that. But he had a dog from every village when it came to the reels and the line that he was using. So once we got them all 10 pound test, all across the board, I'll take all my trolling reels at the beginning of a season. I will put on all the same amount of backing for monofilament. I use 17 pound test trailing XD. I'll put on like four or 500 foot till the line counter says 500 on every one and they all look the same. And then I'll fill them all to the same amount with monofilament. Then I will grab all eight lines or all 10 line counter lines and I will step off 30 feet. And I'll have my partner read every one of those reels. Then I'll go to 60, then I'll go to 90. Then we'll reel them all back in real carefully. And if one of them was off, it gets cold from the herd and it goes on eBay. Never buy a reel or a lure that I sell on eBay. You don't want it. <laughs> I want them all to be consistent. So that way if one rig is catching a fish, and if that one rig's catching a fish in the third rod holder with the board farthest from the boat, you better darn well put that same rod and that same rod holder in that same board position because there's been times I've tried to duplicate four rods with the four same lures or I moved a rod and that one rod still caught all the fish. I can't explain it. I can't tell you why it happens. It's just a matter of like my dad says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it turn is go slow because fish will come up farther. What's cool about the crappies is with walleyes, we put our deeper baits on the inside and our shallower baits on the outside. With crappies, the shallower baits were working on the inside. The only thing I could think of is we would turn and the electric trolling motor would wash out sideways and bust up schools of shad. And those fish would chase those schools of shad higher and hit the baits, that's one reason. We were down in Chicago this year and a, and a musky fisherman got up there and threw a musky bait out. It landed right in the center of a school of shiner that all the fish in the hog trough had been ignoring all day long. As soon as that musky bait landed, those fish busted up, those minnows busted up, a feeding frenzy ensued. It triggered those fish. I talked to the tank guy. He says, yeah, it's interesting. Two shiners, them two shiners right there you see swimming together, they'll swim along all day long and until they get split up, it's over. One goes one way, one goes the other way, and all of a sudden the fish go eat both shiners. It's, it's, it's how they react. But, the inside lines, maybe our crappies are different. Maybe we need to set our inside lines higher and our outside lines deeper. I can't tell you that yet, but I'm working on it. This is what it looked like when we were marking the fish. Here's six to eight foot down. Here's bait fish, here's a brush pile. Look at these big blobs, these are all crappies. And then look up here. We were watching crappies bust the surface. Found out that some of the guys were determined the second day as the water warmed up, they were catching fish two foot below the surface. The highest we ran a bait practice was four foot down. We never ran a bait two foot underneath the surface. And in this last tournament, it was a cold front, so those fish never got up. But by the second day, things started warming up, and our lures that were four foot under the surface started outfish our lures that were five foot under the surface. 
So that's one thing to never forget again is those high fish. What if? <coughs> Planer boards rock these high fish. And that's, I think, why we're not as good of crappie fishermen as a lot of guys we're fishing against. I just feel that we're reaching out to more fish and we're putting lures in front of spooky fish that normally wouldn't bite something flat off the boat, but they'll bite things off the side. And in the last day when we were reeling in one of the last fish, I'm trying to clear a rod there. And while I was clearing that rod, I got bit. I had speeded up the lure and brought it up higher. Cleared another rod, we had a triple right as we were coming in. They wanted it faster the second day because down in Grenada, the bite started to pick up. They told us trolling wasn't happening. We got first and second in the championship. They won the father, son, or the youth division. The only division we did win was the male-female division, and that's because Kyle's Adam's apple stuck out too far. <laughs> but in any event, when they say that the fish ain't biting, I want that to drive you. Promise me you're gonna let that drive you. You're gonna get rid of stinking thinking, and you're gonna say, well, it may not have been, they may not have been biting for number 373, but they might be biting for good old me. Get the right boat, get the right tackle, get bored, get on the water, and get you some. Folks, I'm Tommy Scarless. Thank you so much for having me on.